All right, how's it going everyone? Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the two most relied on senses in our body are both our vision and our hearing. Uh, so we'll go through these uh, fairly quickly, um, simply talking about the different um, structures of the um, uh, of the eye and the ears and kind of some aspects of it and how it works. So uh, let's start with your eye. So simply put, we've got a couple major structures here that you need to keep uh, track of and just uh, remember what they do. Simply put, cornea is on the outer edge, uh, outer part of the eye, uh, literally just there to keep you perfect, uh, protected, uh, keep dust and all, all other sorts of nonsense out of the, uh, you know, really imperative areas on the inside um, of your eyeball. Uh, you have your pupil. Uh, the pupil is the black spot in the center of your eye. Um, it is the window into your eye. This is what allows light to come in uh, from the outside world. Um, your iris is the muscle, the colored muscle that is around the pupil. And its job is to uh, contract and retract in order to allow more or less light into the eye. Um, so this is what allows you to, uh, you know, if you stay outside at night um, for a short period of time, your sight will get better and better and better as your, um, your iris expands the pupil to allow as much light as possible in there. Um, so this is why uh, when you go to the movie theater and you watch a, a movie in the dark and then you step out, if it's in the middle of the day and it's really bright and sunny, it's very painful because your um, iris has pulled your pupil back as far as they can to allow in as much light. And then when you step out, when there's a ton of light, it can be physically painful. Uh, so next we have the lens. Um, and the lens is uh, sits behind the pupil and the iris. And basically what happens is when light comes in through uh, the pupil, it is going to refract off the lens and hit the retina in the back. We'll talk about that. Um, the lens like changes shape uh, to allow us to like better see um, things. It allows us to uh, better see um, uh, the, uh, allows us to better see and focus in on certain things, depending on what we're like paying attention to. Uh, so if you're looking at something that's close in, the lens will change shape to, so the thing that you're looking through will come into focus. So on the back of the eye, you have the retina. And the retina is where our receptor cells are stored. Uh, these are your rods and cones, and we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. Uh, but this is where the light is going to, re to refract back hit the retina, the, um, the rods and cones are going to pick up that information and they're going to send it on to uh, the occipital lobe of the brain. Uh, the way it does that is through the optic nerve. You can see this optic nerve traveling through. Uh, this is going to go back to the occipital lobe. Basically all information that hits the retina is going to travel through and go to uh, the optic nerve. And that information is going to be sent back to the brain so that uh, the brain knows what's going on. Uh, the fovea, uh, basically this is, as it says, the point of central focus. This is where um, your focus and attention is. So at the moment it might be on uh, the, you know, the eye or maybe you've got your phone and you're looking down at your phone and seeing what that's where everything else is kind of in the background and the fovea is where your attention uh, lies. So those are the major parts of the eye the basics of how your eye works. Light comes in through the pupil. It is refracted off the lens, hits the retina. The receptor cells in the retina pick up that information and send it off to uh, the, um, the occipital lobe for us to process. So um, light travels in waves. Um, and simply put, this is something that you're just going to have to remember. Um, I've got this graphic up for both um, light and sound. So um, recognizing the differences between um, different colors and how you can tell. Uh, shorter wavelengths are blue, longer wavelengths are more red in color, um, high amplitudes are bright, low amplitudes are dull. So make sure that you know the difference between frequency and amplitude 
frequency is how long the wavelengths are. If you like stick a point and you have a timer, and it's how long it takes for multiple waves, the crests of those waves to travel, to like, to, to pass that point. Um, like what, how, how long does it take from wave, the top of wave one, so you get your wave, how long does it take for the top of wave one to hit, and then how long does it take for top of wave two and top of wave three, and that tells you what your, uh, your frequency is. Um, and so the lower the frequency, the more red the color, higher the frequency, the more blue, and amplitude is just the height of the wave, how tall is the top of the wave versus the bottom of the wave. And that'll tell us how bright or how dull the, um, the color is. Now for sound, high pitched have a higher frequency, low pitch have a lower frequency, loud sounds have a high amplitude, low sounds have a small amplitude. And these are just things that you gotta remember for your quizzes and tests. So uh, kind of harkening back to that blind spot, one of the things that you can do to kind of test that, cover your right eye and with your left eye, look at the, um, the, the plus sign and basically what you kind of move yourself back and forth until the block that what's going to happen is that spot is going to disappear and what this is showing us is that where that optic nerve leaves to go send information to the brain that we don't have any retinal um, sensory receptors in that in that spot and so you have a blind spot in both of your eyes but because our uh, field of vision like crosses over each other um, that picks it up and also our brain just kind of fills in the gap um, it knows that you know the wall that you're that's in the background or whatever there's a specific spot that's missing and so it just kind of colors it in for you and you you never really notice unless you you know trick your brain and like really try to see it and uh, you know that's the same thing like if you just hold your you know cover one of your eyes you're still going to be able to see everything that you don't literally see a blind spot and that's the brain just kind of filtering that and uh, putting that in for you. So uh, next we need to talk about accommodation. So accommodation is when I was talking about how the lens changes shape in order to refract that light back. That's what accommodation is. It is the process of the lens changing shape to help us focus in on certain things. And that ability and or the shape of your eyeballs is going to um, tell us our visual acuity, how sharp our vision is. And so um, this is this will tell us what, you know, if you're nearsighted or farsighted, whether your lens is doing the proper job or if you're, you know, your eyes a little bit misshapen. Uh, so to give you an idea, visual representation of this, normal vision, think about uh, a projector. You have the image, you project that image, and when the image is perfect for someone who has 20-20 vision, it is, the perfect image is right on the retina. And so you see it properly. For someone who is nearsighted, which means that they are good at seeing things that are up close, but not so good at seeing things that are really far away, what is happening is their perfect image is ending before, is like because like forms before it hits the retina and so what happens is the image keeps getting stretched out as it gets bigger and so by the time it hits the retina it's like fuzzy and, and big and so that's what's happening with farsighted instead of farsighted the image um, reaching it perfectly before the perfect image is behind and so the image that does hit the retina is like scrunched up and small. So remember, farsighted means that you're good at seeing things far away. Nearsighted means that you're good at seeing things up close. Um, and accommodation is that process of your lens changing shape to help us focus in on certain things. And this is why, uh, along with your eye shape, why you're either, you know, why you need to wear glasses or you don't. So next, uh, we need to like delve into the retina and talk about the different sensory receptor cells. So remember, when we are talking about receptor cells, basically what receptor cells do is they take one type of energy and they transform it into another type of energy. So light travels in waves, but we don't have a bunch of waves bouncing around inside our brain. Our rods and cones take those waves, those take those wavelengths, and transfers that energy into 
um, uh, into uh, neural signals that get tra that travel down through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of the brain. And that process is known as transduction, is the turning of one energy type into another. And that's how we see is that those, the rods and cones pick up and recognize different types of wavelengths, takes that information and sends it off to the occipital lobe for us to be like, oh, that's the color blue, or that movement is, you know, an elephant, something like that, okay? So rods and cones, once again, there are sensory receptor cells. They have specific jobs. So the cones do what it says up here. They're near the center of the retina. So remember when we were talking about the fovea, the fovea is at the center of the eye. It's what we're focused on, okay? So that picks up fine detail. It picks up color, and it's really good in daylight. It's not so great at night. Okay, rods, on the other hand, on the peripheries of the retinas, it's much better at picking up movement. Um, it uh, does not have the ability to see color, and uh, it's uh, really good in, or it's much better in darkness. Um, this allows us, like, think about what's important. If you are in a dark, scary place, what do you want to be able to see? Do you want to see color or do you want to see movement out of the corner of your eye so you can know like, oh my gosh, something is coming for me. Uh, so those are rods and cones. Remember that they are receptor cells and that their um, job is to transfer one type of energy into another. And by doing that, it's picking up all the information of the things that we see. So um, this is just a quick look at kind of a, a rehash, but one thing that I did want to note is that cones, we have about 6 million per eye and uh, 120 rods. So way more rods than we do cones, but that's just, that's just a number, just something to think about. Okay, so then what we need to take a look at is the uh, young Hemholtz theory. So this is a theory on how we see color or what, like, what is the process? How, does, how do our eyes see color? What is this process? How does it differentiate different colors? So just focus on the trichromatic aspect of this. You have three different colors. You have red, you can't see that because it's a red on red. You have red, you have green, and you have blue. I'm sorry, I'm in the way of the blue. So basically what this is saying is that your cones pick up these different colors um, and any combination of those colors allow us to see all the shades of whatever. And so your, you know, when you see the color purple, the light that's coming through is activating both the red and the blue cones. And they're just like, oh, hey, this is like this certain shade. And they send that information off. So trichromatic theory, um, looking at those three specific colors and everything else is based off of, off of those. Um, and one way of looking at that is people who are colorblind. Generally speaking, people who are colorblind are missing one or two or sometimes even three of those colors. They just can't see them or they don't see them very well. And that's kind of hinting that shows us, okay, well, this is, this is how, how we process different types of colors. Another example or another theory on how we process vision is the herring or opponent process theory of color vision. So basically what this is saying is you have um, two sets of two colors, red, green, blue, yellow, and they are opposites of each other. So when you see the color red, your red cones turn on. But while the red cones turn on, the green ones turn completely off. They go down, okay? And so what happens is when, whenever you see these different, these opposing colors, they flip on, on and off. Uh, and so what you're going to see is if you take a, a minute, look at this picture for a period of time, like 30 or 30 or 40 seconds, and then you close your eyes, you'll see the opposite color in your, um, like in the, in the lights behind your eyes, because what's happening is your green and yellows are getting oversaturated as they're doing all this work and the blues and reds are like really turned off and so then when you close your eyes it switches this doesn't turn all the way on but this goes back to neutral but the turning off goes back to neutral and that like and you can see it kind of in the back of your your eyelids so opponent, opponent process theory make sure that you know the difference between trichromatic and opponent process Okay, so now let's get to our sense of hearing. Okay, so uh, this graphic is great, except for it doesn't have one thing. It doesn't have the pinna. Okay, so we're just going to talk about how we hear by pointing out each part of 
uh, each part of the ear and telling us what it does. So the pinna is the flappy part of the ear out here, and you can see it's all curved and it's got all these like weird ridges and stuff. And its job is to funnel sound from the outside in. So one of the things that you can do is if you have like a direct speaker or something, you can take your, you can, instead of, you know, if you're not using headphones, you can direct your hearing like this, like I can already hear myself better because not only is my ear pointed that direction, but I also have my hand. And so all of the sound waves that are traveling, I'm picking up so many of them and it's getting bounced around in here and then it's going into the auditory canal, bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around, and it hits the eardrum. Now the eardrum is gonna be our first instance of transduction within the ear, um, within hearing, because you have sound waves that then get turned into vibrations. The eardrum is gonna to begin to vibrate. Those vibrations are gonna travel along the bones of the middle ear until they hit the cochlea. Okay, the bones of the middle ear, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, probably won't need to know those names, uh, but then it's gonna hit the cochlea. Now, the cochlea has fluid inside of it, and the fluid is going to um, like vibrate as the vibrations hit the cochlea. So uh, the fluid is going to ripple, that's the word I was looking for. The cochlea vibrates, the fluid ripples, and there are hair cells within the cochlea, which are the receptor cells for hearing are going to pick up that information and send it along the auditory nerve up to uh, the temporal lobe of the brain and we're gonna and we're gonna process that information so once again sound waves travel they hit and are uh, bounce and the the pinna scoops them up and sends them into the auditory canal they don't s scoop them up but they you know they bounce the wave so they go into the auditory canal the uh, bounces through the auditory canal hits the eardrum, eardrum begins to vibrate, first method of transduction. Those vibrations go through the bones of the middle ear, hammer, anvil, stirrup, hits the cochlea, cochlea begins to vibrate, the fluid inside the cochlea begins to ripple, and those ripples are picked up by the hair cells in there, where you have another instance of transduction, and those, um, uh, and those, uh, vib those ripples are gonna turn into, um, uh, neural uh, uh, messages, and that's going to get sent up to uh, the temporal lobe of the brain. And that's how you hear. So we have two theories on how we um, hear sound, excuse me, how we hear pitch, how we recognize different pitch, pitches. We have two theories. They both work. They both help explain dis different aspects of them. So first we have place theory. And basically what it says is that we have specific areas of the cochlea, so we're in the cochlea right now, specific hair cells within the cochlea that pick up specific frequencies. So you have the really high frequencies are in one section, kind of as you get uh, lower, and then um, as you get a little bit higher, you have the really, uh, the really low, low section. So if you have someone who's like, sings like this and that's a really deep voice this area of your uh, cochlea would begin to ripple and vibrate um well the whole thing would vibrate but those um uh those specific hair cells would begin to activate and so once those things activate and send that information to the temporal lobe we know oh okay it's a deep bass voice or something like that so now with the frequency theory basically what the frequency theory says is that everything vibrates all of the cochlea vibrates but it is dependent on how they vibrate and how they move and how they react to it and that is how we know what is the different types of um, pitch so one says the place theory says specific areas activate and because of those that specific activate area activated we know what type of um we know the pitch and the frequency theory says everything activates but it depends on how it moves and it depends on how it receives it that's how it knows what type of um uh, pitch that you are dealing with okay so conduction and nerve hearing loss. So we have two specific types of hearing loss here. So the first is conduction.
Conduction is saying that there is a specific mechanical break in the ear that is causing the um, that is causing the issue. So either the eardrum is has busted. Like so, think about amplitude of um, think about the amplitude of a wavelength, and think about the louder it is, the bigger this amplitude, and think about that bouncing around in your auditory canal before it hits the um, the eardrum. And so what happens, you know, you have a gunshot go off right next and the, all, the, the cochlea vibrates like crazy and then splits. And so what you have is that is, that means that those vibrate, the, the sound waves are not really getting turned into vibrations and it really breaks up our ability to hear from that side. So conduction hearing loss is a mechanical break in our hearing. If one of the motor functions is not working, and so that is why it's not, not happening. Nerve hearing loss is saying that the receptor cells, the hair cells within the cochlea, are generally fading away. All of our, all of our hearing loss as we get older, not all of it, but most of it is nerve hearing loss as you know, we're constantly listening to things, we're constantly listening to music, we're constantly having conversations, and after a long period of time, those things just start to die. So those are the two types of damage that you can have to your ears and uh, or two types of damage that uh, can happen to your ears and how we lose hearing over a period of time.